Good morning. I want to thank all of you for joining us today. I'm here along with Iowa Secretary of Agriculture and Land Stewardship, Bill Northey, DNR Director Chuck Yip, and Dr. John Lawrence, Associate Dean for Iowa State College of Agriculture, to discuss water quality. As you likely know, our state has a very strong agriculture industry that supports families, local communities, and has definitely been a benefit to uh, the Iowa economy uh, because we're, uh, agriculture has done so well in recent years. In addition, our state has been successful in growing jobs to help working families and reducing regulations that have been burdensome, have been a burdensome cost on communities and Iowa households. And we plan to continue our efforts to have a climate that fosters economic growth and innovation. With that said, we're here today to share with you a strategy document on water quality that works towards finding a common sense, balanced approach to protecting our waterways without hindering our communities, jobs, and Iowa families. Over the past 24 months, the Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship, DNR, and Iowa State have been working together on a comprehensive strategy document that outlines a voluntary, science-based approach to reduce the amount of nutrients in Iowa's waters. This report addresses point sources such as city wastewater treatment plants or industries and non-point sources such as runoff from our farms and urban areas in a comprehensive approach. Since the planning for this strategy document began, both Lieutenant Governor Reynolds and I have met with Secretary Northey and Director Gift to discuss the progress, and I'm pleased to be with them today as they release this document for public comment. I would encourage all interested Iowans to review this information and engage in the open comment period. The strategy document is available at the Iowa State University website, and this is also linked in through the press release I'll put out by my office today. Iowa State, DNR, and the Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship have done a tremendous job over the past two years on this project, and I'd like to acknowledge them for their good work. With that said, I would now like to turn the microphone over to our Iowa Secretary of Agriculture and Land Stewardship and my good friend, Bill Moore. Well, thank you, Governor. Uh, this is a significant day. As the governor mentioned, this is a process that uh, has been in place for a couple of years. As, uh, we have been looking at all the science involved and the opportunity to be able to put a strategy together. Uh, this is a meaningful step uh, forward to uh, get those practices on the ground, to be able to get in front of producers and then to be able to get them on the ground to uh, better prevent erosion and to better protect water quality in Iowa. I'm extremely proud that our department, uh, the Department of Natural Resources, Iowa State University, as well as key stakeholder groups uh, have worked together to compile this draft. This is the first time such an integrated and comprehensive approach to addressing water quality issues have been attempted. This is both point source and non-point, as the governor mentioned, and in one document and very comprehensive in the strategies that can address them. This keeps Iowa as a national leader in addressing nutrient loading. Um, Iowa farmers continue to aggressively install new conservation practices. Uh, and this strategy will help them to continue to do that and use those practices to reduce nitrogen and phosphorus loading. In the last five years, the state cost share programs have helped farmers to install 16,350 practices that protect 228,000 acres. That would save 3 million tons of soil over the life of those practices. Iowa has invested $56 million in, in those cost share uh, programs, and the Iowa farmers have invested an additional $78 million in putting those practices on the ground. In addition to that, Iowa farmers have borrowed another $75 million from the state revolving fund to put those conservation practices on their land as well. Uh, so the release of this strategy is very important, but it's just a starting point. Uh, it's a 
It's an opportunity for folks to take a look at it. We ask for your comments. It will be on the website such that you can look at it and comment over the next 45 days of what you see, how it could be improved, the thoughts that, uh, that you have as well. Uh, the driving force of this is to, uh, to focus our efforts on best management practices to reduce the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus leaving our farms. This, this uh, uh, strategy also looks at new and emerging technologies that allow us in the future as well to do a better job. Uh, and so those are important things that we want included and certainly comments on those as well. Finally, this is not about rules and regulations. This is about giving farmers resources to help them voluntarily improve a water quality. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to my good friend and director of BNR, Chuck Denton. Thank you, Governor, and thank you, Secretary Norrie and John Lawrence. Uh, this is a great day we have today. Uh, we have the opportunity to release a strategy, the start of a strategy, and how we're going to address both point and non-point source, um, uh, point and non-point source nutrients to, that contribute to water quality or the lack of water quality. This has been done, uh, attempted to be done before. Uh, however, the, the problem with the previous attempts is that we've just focused on either non-point or point source separately. Early on in this process, when we started this over two years ago, it was recognized that if we were going to be successful, that we had to combine the efforts of both point source and non-point source generators. That way, one side couldn't just simply point to the other side as to, to, to the facet that contributed most heavily towards water quality. That if we combine the efforts of both, that you didn't, you, you reduce the opportunity to what we call the circular firing sky, where everybody simply points it together as the problem of, of, of nutrients into our water supply. So this has been a combined effort of both point source generators and the stakeholders of point source generators as well as non-point source. This time I'd like to recognize some of those people that contributed heavily to our stakeholders. That's the League of Cities, IAWEA, as well as uh, Association of Industry representatives for those non-point source contributors. They have uh, allowed numerous hours throughout this past two years to come up with the strategy today. So we are very happy to be here today to be a part of the strategy announcement and know that uh, this is the beginning of the process rather than the end of the process. It will be now be open for public comment for a considerable period of time, be available for others to, to put their comments into the strategy. So it's a great day for Iowans that we're both here today at non-point and non-point point and non-point source, non source generators. That uh, another key piece of this strategy is how we're going to implement, how we're going to get information out to that. And John Lawrence from Iowa State Extension is here to talk about that effort. John? Uh, good morning. I'd like to thank the, the Governor and Director Gibb and Secretary Norley for including Iowa State in this process. Uh, we're pleased to be involved in this opportunity. A team, we led a team of scientists from Iowa State University. Uh, Department of Ag and Land Stewardship, Department of Natural Resources, uh, USDA Agricultural Research Service, the Natural Resource Conservation Service, as well as some other institutions to really go through and evaluate the, the practices, the science behind the practice, and the cost of those, and looking at infield and edge of field and landscape changes that impact nutrient loss to our waters. I want to thank those scientists who spent uh, 24 months looking at this, a very dedicated group that put a tremendous amount of time and effort. This work has been peer reviewed and just last week was presented at a conference in, in Davenport to other scientists and agency people in the north central region so that maybe they could learn from our process. Uh, what this uh, two years of work provides is a research foundation for what practices have the greatest impact. Uh, and where they, they make the most sense to employ to protect our waters. What it shows is that progress can be made towards these goals of reducing uh, nitrogen and phosphorus loss. There's no one silver bullet that will fix all, but it's going to take a, a combination of practices. And it, the good news is it's a relatively short list of practices that are truly effective <coughs> in reaching those goals. But it will take a relatively high adoption rate take time to get those practices and investments in place. It also shows that there needs to be continued innovation, research, discovery, not only to find new ways, but validate their effectiveness uh, so that we can continue to make progress. Another key role that Iowa State Extension is going to play is in helping get the message out. Uh, as was mentioned, 
place to comment on this, review the document, but also leave comments is at an Iowa State website, uh, nutrientstrategy.iastate.edu. It's live as of this morning. The documents are there, welcoming comments on video from our director and, and secretary and Dean Winterstein. It's also a place to leave comments. All of those comments will come in. They will then go to the appropriate agencies to address during this comment period. We'll also be working with farmers over the next few weeks and, uh, to begin the process of getting the word out. Between now and mid-April, uh, we will, through our pesticide applicator training, we'll directly talk to 16,000 Iowa farmers and introduce this strategy, why it's important, how they can participate, and how they can comment on it. Through our Crop Advantage Series, there are over 2,000 farmers who will attend that. We'll get more detail about the practices and the strategies. Our Integrated Crop Management Conference the week after Thanksgiving will reach a thousand certified crop advisors about their important role in advising farmers. And then our manure application certification program will reach 2,250 farmers and 2,500 commercial manure applicators in the coming year as well. All of this is to begin the process, get the word out, get the momentum going, but it doesn't end April 15th. Uh, this will go on for the years ahead as we begin to make these changes on the landscape. So once again, I would say like to thank the Governor and Secretary Northey and Director Gibb for their leadership on this project. Thank you. John Lawrence, thank you, and I want to thank Bill Northey and, and Chuck Gibb. I also want to point out that I visited last summer a couple of these projects, the uh, Rathbun um, uh, watershed area and what's being done in that area, and then also in Davenport with an urban uh, project where they've made significant difference. So with that, we'd open it to uh, your questions. Governor, in an earlier draft of this report, there were copies or portions that appeared to be copied from Farm Bureau documents. Are those in this draft that's coming out now, and why weren't those attributed? Well, let me ask uh, Chuck Gibb to answer that question. The comment was about the story that was uh, earlier came out in the paper, I think, last, uh, last week. Uh, let me react to this. The Department of Natural Resources is completely behind the strategy that uh, is being introduced to you today. And it's unfortunate that earlier story preempted what was actually the real draft that was put out today, that you will be seeing today. Uh, a number of the critical comments at that particular time are included in this draft. They're included in this draft, and you will see that they prepared. Regardless of what the source is, that's not the story. The story is, the, the, is a good story today that we're going to have a draft that has both point and non-point source collaborating together and moving forward together. That's the story. This hasn't happened before. So it's a good story that we're seeing here today, regardless of what the critical comments were in the past. Once again, those were incorporated in the draft that you see today. The EPA, Other questions? The EPA has threatened to come in and, and uh, regulate Iowa's waterways because the state's enforcement is lax. Does this document address the concerns that the EPA has raised? Once again, Kay, that's an earlier story. Uh, what you need to find out about that story that also appeared in that same newspaper is this was an issue that was brought before the Department of Natural Resources as a result of a potential lawsuit with the EPA in 2007. In 2007, the EPA then did a bunch of investigation to determine whether the department was properly uh, regulating livestock facilities at that time and issued a report in July of this year. At that point, we also issued a press release about what that was. These uh, groups that actually challenged the EPA to take over, it's called de-delegation, actually had 31 allegations. The EPA determined that 26 of those had no basis in fact or were already taken care of by the department, which let five remainder. The department then had 60 days in order to respond to those remaining five allegations, and we did so by September 11th. We are currently undergoing continued negotiation and having uh, discussions as to what the, the, those five, remaining five are. One of those was that we don't levy enough fines. I can tell you that the vast majority of the manure spills that take place are accidents, and whether you charge a $30,000 fine or a $5,000 fine isn't going to prevent that. We have consistently, over the last several years, tried to uh, work with uh, agricultural producers to get them in compliance and keep them in compliance rather than play, sit back and play got you. The result of that, we've had less spills and less contamination as a result of that because we're working proactively with the agricultural industry to reduce those spills. So 
Once again, that is a story that's not complete. Uh, we are currently undergoing negotiations, continue to uh, undergoing negotiations with the EPA. We feel that uh, we will get them to understand the importance of having Iowa remain the regulator of livestock facilities in the state. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, why did DNR depart from the usual procedures for stakeholder meetings in developing this, yeah. this is a collaborative report, and there and, and there is now going to be adequate opportunity for comments from any citizen that has uh, suggestions or ideas. But I, what I like about this is instead of pointing the finger at each other, which has been the case in the past, uh, instead we're trying to work together to have a comprehensive, thoughtful strategy that addresses these issues and also recognizes the importance of agriculture. Remember, why is Iowa so much healthier and stronger than a lot of other states? It's because of the health and prosperity of agriculture. And we don't want to destroy the opportunity for farmers to make a living on the land. We also don't want uh, a lot of our cities to have to dramatically increase their property taxes at a time they have a lot of citizens that are struggling. So we're trying to come up with a thoughtful way that we can address the issues for the cities, and for industry, and for our agriculture producers, and do it in a way that uses the best science. So I'm very appreciative of the scientists that have worked on this from Iowa State, and the, the committed uh, people in both uh, departments of Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship, and, and the uh, Department of Natural Resources. Other questions? Give us an idea of what these new practices are. John, why don't you? Um, you said there's a short list, so. There is uh, one table in the uh, nitrogen document, or one table in the phosphorus document, uh, probably a dozen, a dozen practices on each one of those. We have some pictures of those here. And it's, the important thing to think about is what, what issue are you addressing? Phosphorus moves with soil, so things that protect the soil, like buffer strips, terraces, grass waterways, and so on, help the tillage practices. Reduce tillage will help protect the soil and reduce phosphorus reaching the waterway. Nitrogen tends to move with water, and so practices that uh, address water, like our uh, wetlands, the bioreactors, are a piece of that as well. We also address uh, application rates. We base things on our university recommendations, and uh, how are we doing compared to that? Uh, we also looked at things like uh, strategic land retirement. So is there a small strips throughout the field that will help protect soil and so on, and the impact that those may have? Uh, again, those, those are in the document, but we have some examples of them. I would also say one of the things that's happened in recent years is the use of GPS has helped farmers dramatically uh, reduce overuse of uh, chemicals and fertilizers, being able to scientifically put on just the right amount at the right place. Uh, that's something we didn't have available uh, in the past, but something that many farmers have incorporated into their operation, and it saved them money as well as helped us protect our, our, our water quality. Other questions? Is there any um, thought about restricting tiling, drainage, those sorts of issues? Because you said, obviously, things move with water. Uh, and we talk about a couple of strategies to do with tiling. Uh, we look at uh, drainage water management, which is research going on that is not restricting the amount of tiling, but regulating when we release water. So that the tile is there, the land needs to be productive. Land and, and used, and people invest in that land. But can we control the flow of that water? Can we, we talk about saturated buffers as a potentially a technology that we release that into a buffered area uh, at the bottom of a field, so on, so that the perennials uh, that are there may take up those nutrients? That would be an example of a practice. Another would be, as again, if you look at these uh, mitigation wetlands here that the tiles are directed into a wetland, a natural biological process, 
uh, removes nitrogen before it is released on downstream. Other questions? Other topics? Other now? topics, yeah. We, we can accept uh, questions on other topics. Uh, you mean with the N NAACP folks today? Um, right. Uh, how do you assess uh, their complaints about voter disenfranchisement? Well, I'm, I, I'll find out today what their concerns might be. We've had a very constructive meetings with them, and we try to work very closely with the NAACP. I'm proud of the progress we've made on, on some of the issues and concerns. I can tell you that um, big improvements have been made in the Civil Rights Department, uh, and uh, that department was kind of dysfunctional before I took office. Uh, but uh, you know, we have great leadership there now. We've got much more confident people that are they're getting the cases decided much sooner, and I've heard good things from people in the civil rights movement about that. Uh, one of the things they bring up is that about felons, yeah. and felons not having the ability. To, is that something that you'll work with them? Is that is there any opening there at all? Well, yeah, we have a process where felons can earn their rights back, and and we try to do what we can to expedite that process and make sure that if somebody that has paid their dues to society. Uh, serve their time, pay their fine, court costs. If they're current on their restitution requirements, uh, uh, they can get their their rights back. But we also think it's fair to society that when somebody commits a crime like that, that, that they have to earn their rights back by having completed uh, uh, the sentence and and the requirements and, of of the sentence. So it doesn't sound like you would change anything regarding the executive order you signed when you first took office? Well, remember, uh, we just restored the practice that was in place when I was governor before. And we think it's a very fair practice, but we're always willing to, and, and I would also say the parole board, I think, has made some very significant improvements as well. And we've seen a dramatic reduction in the prison population since I've been governor. Uh, we have new leadership in the parole board. Uh, they're in the process of modernizing the system. So they're going to be able to review people for parole earlier. Uh, I think that's going to help address some of the concerns that we, and I shared, the last meeting we had with the NAACP, I shared with them what we were planning there, and that's just in the process of moving forward. Now, you, you probably are aware that uh, uh, those changes are going before the Rules Review Committee. We expect they will be approved, and uh, this is going to make it easier for them to be able to release people on parole that are not uh, dangerous, that are good risks. Have you received any indication from HHS how quickly they'll respond to the 50 questions you submitted to them? And if, they, if it isn't timely, do you think you'll have to ask for an extension beyond that December 15th deadline? Well, well first of all, you, you need to know that the Republican Governors Association submitted a number of those questions way back last summer and they still haven't been answered. And then we have some additional Iowa-specific questions that we have put on the list. Uh, many of the governors are very frustrated that the DHS, uh, that the Federal Department of Health, uh, Health and Human Services is not prepared and has not been able to answer these, these questions. And that's why a lot of states, remember, we have three choices. You can, the state can put together its own specific state exchange or you can let the federal government have control it with the federal exchange, or you could maybe partner with some other states. And we're we're looking at all options. Um, a number of states have just said uh, no. Uh, and, and, and I guess one of the things that's frustrating is the one state exchange that's been in place for a number of years and seems to have worked effectively is Utah. And the governor of Utah has been informed, no, the federal government's not going to approve it. They're not going to approve it. So if, are we going to go through this whole process and then find out the federal government is going to basically um, mandate and control it anyway and then blame us uh, if it doesn't work out the way it should work out? And, and I guess we have some real big questions about that. We also have some big questions involving the massive federal deficit in this, this whole uh, uh, budget cliff we're about ready to go off at the beginning of the first of the year, uh, whether indeed the federal government is going to be able to uh, fulfill the commitment they've made under this, paying for this expansion. And there's also a question of what is it really 
in past history is when the federal government has embarked on these new entitlement programs, they've grossly underestimated the cost. That being the case, uh, and the federal government with its huge budget problems, is that burden going to be placed on the taxpayers of our state? And uh, that's the reason why, you know, it's like trying to buy a car when they won't tell you what the price is and they won't tell you what the mileage is. Do you want to buy into that kind of a situation? And I don't think that's fair to the taxpayers of my state to do that. Okay, great. Thank you, Governor. Thank you.